Okay, it is now uh, three minutes past three, so I guess we can uh, we can already start this webinar. I see that uh, 73 people have uh, have joined this webinar, so I think it's uh, it's good to see that uh, this is a topic that is of interest for everybody. And I see that um, our president, the president of Ina Demetrios Piros, is also attending this uh, this webinar. So uh, welcome to everybody. Hello from uh, from Brussels. And uh, so we'll be talking today about implementing uh, public warning systems. So I just want, first of all, to um, first to, to recall that this webinar is going to be recorded uh, so that you can still uh, listen to the recording afterwards. If you miss some information, everybody will be everything will be published on our website. And uh, you, of course, have the possibility to, possibility to ask questions. So the way this uh, webinar is going to go is that I will first uh, recall the aim of this webinar, the context, then we'll have the speaker's presentation. And after the, the presentations of, uh, of the speakers, after each presentation, there will be a, a question and an answer session. So you'll be able to uh, to ask some questions to uh, to the, the speakers. To do so, you see that on the tool that we're using, there's, um, there's a specific um, a specific function to ask questions. So you can uh, send those questions in a, a written way and then I will be able to uh, to read these questions to uh, to the speakers so feel free to uh, to participate and ask questions because this webinar is of course about uh, you get, getting the information that uh, that you need so it's important that you in case you have some doubts you um, you make sure that all these doubts are, are answered um, so I'll just first of all give a few uh, words about the of introduction of this, this webinar and uh, about the, the context of the webinar because uh, uh, we are basically kind of halfway through the implementation of the European Electronic Communications Code, at least for the Article 110. I guess uh, I guess most of you are, are, are busy now with uh, with implementing these um, the, the provisions of the Electronic Communications Code. Uh, for those who don't know it, um, it basically requires so it's a it's a European directive that was voted uh, now two years ago. And it basically requires the member states of the European Union to implement by June 2022 um, a public warning systems that is based on a telecommunications networks. So basically, to make sure that we can use the telecommunications networks to send public warning alerts uh, to uh, the population of a, of a specific um, area. So this is the, the main article, and obviously this. Uh, there's a few more provisions and uh, as, as we say the devil is in the details but uh, in case you have some doubts you can check our website and you'll also find all the information that you need about the implementation of the of the code but what uh, i wanted to say, say here is that basically there's two technologies that can uh, basically um, allow you to comply with the with the european legislation and the, these technologies are cell broadcast and location-based sms we will not recall the, the advantages and weaknesses of both technology during this uh, this webinar. I mean, it's not only only about that, and uh, and you can easily find the information about these two technologies on our, on our website. But um, actually, so while the the ECC is is a mandate properly on the technology, as we have just seen, uh, there's actually many more things to. Uh, to take into account when implementing public warning systems it's actually not only about the technology to have a public warning an effective public warning system but it's also about considering different alerting channels that should be considered as our speakers will uh, will be recording that in in, in their presentation um, not only that but then uh, it's it's also about how you use the public warning systems that that is in place so obviously by june 2022 there will be public warning systems but then um, to, to make it uh, to make it effective and, and beneficial to the population it's all about the way it is uh, used by the emergency services so I guess it will be also interesting to hear from our speakers uh, some uh, some aspects about that and obviously this should come with a clear strategy in place uh, by the public authorities on how this public warning system is going to to be used so to to answer all these points uh, we are joined by uh, two speakers. So we have with us uh, Mr. George Karayanis, who's Deputy Secretary General for Civil Protection and uh, uh, the Civil Protection of Greece, obviously. And uh, George, you're going to, to tell us about the, the experience of implementing 
uh, public warning systems in uh, in Greece, the, the challenges that you had to face also, and the, the lessons learned from the from the experience, so that it, it can also benefit to public authorities in, uh, in in other countries. And this presentation will be followed by uh, a presentation from Johnny Duvinet, uh, who's here with us. He's professor professor in geography at the, the University of Avignon, uh, that's in the south of France. And Johnny is going to uh, tell us about some aspects, um, and several different aspects to, to take into account for the public authorities when uh, implementing and also using um, public warning systems. So the first speaker today is, uh, is George. I will give the floor now to, uh, to George Karayanis. Uh, thank you, Benoit. Uh, okay, uh, good afternoon and good morning to those of you joining us from other parts of the world. Public information has become an increasingly critical function in emergency management. According to the literature and <clears throat> of emergency crisis management and lessons learned from emergencies around the world, coordinating public information may be the primary or sole purpose for the activation of emergency operation centers or a similar facility. Warnings are the most prominent component of uh, public information in the response phase. They provide vital information to the population and allow people to take measures to protect themselves and property and at times prepare for an impending disaster. In what follows, I will, I will discuss the design of Greece's integrated public alert and warning system, its deployment in the country in the last year, and lessons learned from the, del from the delivery of this warning capability. Let me start by taking you mentally, of course, uh, on the island of Samos, Greece. It's October, you're enjoying some well-earned holidays late in the season. Uh, you're lying on a beach reading a book when suddenly you hear a deep roar and the, and the earth beneath you starts to shake. The, the shake lasts a few seconds, but it feels like hours. You fall off your lounge chair. The shaking eventually stops. You're as scared as you've ever been. A cloud of dust is rising from where Vathi, the island's capital, was supposed to be. You barely pull yourself together when all the cell phones on the beach start making a weird sound. You pick up your phone and you see this message on your screen. You move away from the waterfront just in time to save yourself from harm as the water rises. You tell yourself it was a close call, but it, it could have been worse. This was an exaggerated narrative of the earthquake and tsunami that hit Samos last October. The earthquake was a 7.0 and generated a tsunami of fortunately only about one meter high. The narrative, however, illustrates how one would receive an alert from Greece's integrated public alert and warning system. So that naturally begs the question, how did the system come to be and how does it work? Well, the design of the system was a multidisciplinary exercise, which integrated emergency management, social science, and information communications technology. Oh, uh, I must, okay. Uh, when receiving a warning, to, to, decide a warning to, to design a warning system, I'm sorry, we combine forward and backward planning. The model on this slide describes what happens when somebody receives a warning. What most people find surprising about this model is that uh, warning recipients do not immediately heed protective advice. Instead, they go through a process that involves hearing the warning and understanding the context, the content of the warning message, believing the warning is credible and accurate, personalizing the warning to oneself, confirming the warning is true and others are heeding advice, and last, responding by taking protective action. This model already provides some clues about how a warning system has to be designed to be effective. First, warning messages must be repeated. They must be consistent and they must be confirmed. According to research conducted by disaster sociologists in the 1990s and beyond, a warning is more likely to be believed if it is received by more sources. The effect can, however, be destroyed by, in, by inconsistent messaging. Second, the, content, the context of the message is more important than, it's, than the substance itself. Imagine hearing what's supposed to be a very urgent warning on the radio. If the radio then reverts to its normal program after the message, it will be far less believed than if the station converts completely and immediately to broadcasting emergency messages. Third, equally important are to the perceptions of warnings is the, con the confirmation of warning. 
Warning recipients will seek to confirm the message and its interpretation through social interaction. If others confirm that they have received the message and believe it to be correct, then the warning message will be believed. If there is disconfirmation or doubt, recipients will seek additional information, but more likely there will be a perception that the warning was irrelevant or incorrect. Last, people will, receive, will perceive warnings differently based on the degree of threat and prior experience in disasters. Generally speaking, prior experiences tend to render current warnings more credible if disasters are part of regular experience. In addition to being informed by the warning process itself, the design of GRI pause was based on the planning constraints outlined on, in this slide. First, Greece is a popular tourist destination and we have many foreign visitors year out. The, the summer season marks also the peak of the, of, the, of the tourist season as well. This means that the ideal public alert and warning system needs to work without the need for registration. In addition, messages and protective action guidelines should ideally be available in multiple languages. Furthermore, Greece faces a range of rapid onset hazards, including but not limited to earthquakes, near field tsunamis and wildfires in the wildland urban interface. This means that rapid delivery of messages is an absolute necessity to save lives. Furthermore, uh, the most vulnerable to disasters are not necessarily using the internet email or text messages. There may, pe there may be people who don't have a smartphone, who don't have a cell phone, who do not, do not regu regularly listen or uh, listen to or have their cell phone uh, on their person. This means that we have to use multiple technologies to maximize reach. Last, we need to maintain the availability of the system in times of disaster. This means that the system needs to remain unaffected by network congestion. Based on these assumptions and constraints, the POETI model was used as a framework for building and sustaining the warning capabilities of GRI pause. POETI is a model that divides capabilities into meaningful and broad categories of activity required to build and sustain disaster response capabilities. In this case, this entailed developing uh, plans and procedures for delivering the capability in times of disaster, building an organization supported by leadership, providing equipment, supplies, and systems compliant with the standards, building a training program for all positions, and provide opportunities for continuous improvement via exercises and lessons for, learned from actual incidents. GRI pause was deployed progressively in the second semester of 2019. An interim solution was developed to establish a minimum capability while GRI pause was deployed. The system was deployed in January and was used for the first time in March 2020 to send a nationwide alert providing protection, protective action guidelines, guidance, I'm sorry, for uh, COVID-19. The interim solution was deployed in July 2019, and it was intended as an interim warning capability. It was developed and deployed in partnership with cell phone carriers in the country. It was essentially a location, location-based SMS uh, using manual geotargeting and a pretty coarse geofencing. Uh, it was used only once when uh, uh, a big part of the country was in extreme uh, wildfire danger on August 10 and 11. Arguably, this was an exceptional situation because it was the, the second time only in 20 years since the, wild, since the wildland fire danger metric was established that any part of the country was in, uh, in extreme fire danger. The Emergency Management Act uh, was voted by Parliament in February 2020. It established a comprehensive all hazards emergency management approach. It improved interagency coordination and the emergency management knowledge base. It fostered immediate, re immediate response while uh, assuming using, I'm sorry, a whole community approach. All that while restructuring civil protection Greece and reorganizing uh, the Hellenic Fire Corps. Furthermore, this uh, Emergency Management Act established the National Operations Coordination and Crisis Management Center. In other words, the na a national crisis management structure. This structure is comprised of five units, as you can see uh, in this slide, of which the uh, Emergency Communication Service 112 is the fifth unit. Now, in, within this uh, 
Within the center, the Emergency Communication Service 112 combines a unified multi-agency public safety answering capability for the European Emergency Number 112 with a nationwide integrated public alert and warning system, which will be the, uh, the, the object of, uh, of this presentation. As you see in this slide, which describes the architecture of Greece's integrated public alert and warning system, the national crisis management structure is both the heart and the brains of the system. The national crisis management structure receives information and intelligence from first responders, subject matter experts, and local and regional governments. As soon as the decision to issue an alert has been, uh, has been taken, we send alerts through multiple communications pathways simultaneously with a view to generating repeated, consistent, and confirmed warnings. The goal is for the message to reach as many people as possible as quickly as possible. This awakening effect increases the chances that the message will be confirmed through social interaction and that recipients will heed the advice included in the message. Cell broadcast is a primary communications pathway. All of you probably know the characteristics of cell broadcast all too well, but let me outline some features of the technology that relate to disaster response. First, cell broadcast is, is not affected by cell site network congestion because it uses a different channel than voice, text messages, email, or web. The system sends alerts to all cell phones in a cell coverage area and not to a database of phone numbers. This means that the system is not based on, uh, on subscriptions. You do not need to sign up or register, and you don't need, you don't need to, to download an app. Telephones are delivered opted in, but this can be turned off in settings. Messages can be uh, are uh, 90 characters only, but multiple messages can be concatenated, concatenated in a single page. Uh, in Greece, we have opted to develop messages that can fit in one screen for people to be able to read them uh, uh, more, more easily. Uh, in addition, Greek language encoding has some limitations, which means that in practice, we're limited to about 600 characters per message, which is uh, plenty of room. In addition, uh, messages can include a URL or web link, which can um, uh, provide additional information that can be included in a single uh, cell phone page. Last, uh, cell broadcast does not get uh, any tracking or delivery uh, information, which presents uh, with, a, with an operational advantage in terms of privacy. In addition to cell broadcast, alternative communications pathways are available for those unfamiliar to cell broadcast alerts or those who don't own a smartphone capable of receiving them. The purpose is to maximize reach by providing people with communications pathways they're most familiar with and comfortable with. Therefore, people can register to receive alerts via text message, email, and voice messages. Social media are a, are, are a powerful public communication tool. Despite being largely considered as a slower pathway for early warning, they can help reach more people and add to the effectiveness of an early warning system. In the, uh, in the case of Civil Protection Greece, cell broadcast alerts are posted on the Emergency Communication Service social media accounts. Future plans. In, uh, include using the common alerting protocol we have ab available to link with uh, TV and radio stations and highway variable message signs. The decision to send an alert is based on the hazard itself, its speed of onset, its characteristics, its magnitude, and its intensity. It's also based on the location of the hazard and the location of elements at risk, the time available until the hazard hits, weather and the resources. Once the decision to issue a warning has been taken, the process of issuing uh, a warning include determine the location of the alert, formulating the message, issuing the alert, and most importantly, verifying its reception. We often call emergency response organizations in the alert location to verify that the message has been received as intended. When formulating a warning message, there are several style elements that one needs to consider. First, messages should be specific about the who, the what, the when, the where, the why, and the how. If messages are not specific, 
recipients will spend additional time trying to confirm the message. In either case, this will uh, lead to, to some doubt and will reduce the effectiveness of the message. Second, messages should be consistent, both internally and externally. Internally consistent means that one part of the message should not contradict another part of the same message. Externally consistent means that messages sent via one pathway should not contradict messages sent uh, via another pathway, by another channel. In addition, to the extent possible, alerts should be consistent from event to event to the extent that they refer to the same hazard. In other words, uh, the, the message one sends for a wildfire should be consistent across wildfires. Messages should convey a sense of certainty, both in content and in tone. Not conveying a sense, a sense of certainty will reduce the effectiveness of the message. In other words, it will reduce the, the fraction of your message recipients that will actually heed advice in due, in due course. Messages should be clear. Try to use common words that can easily be understood. If protective instructions are precautionary, state so as clearly as possible. Messages should be accurate. Do not overstate or understate the facts and do not omit important information. Other factors that, sh that uh, should be uh, taken into consideration when formulating warning messages include the message of the, the message of the source, which should be a trusted and credible public official, the inclusion of a map and or a URL, which, which can add to the uh, information that's included in the message, and familiarity of the service. You will find out that as you send messages, as the number of messages you send increases, people become more uh, familiar with the service, and this will lead to more inquiries and will progressively increase the fraction of uh, uh, the warning recipients that will heed advice. Other issues include how to best express how to best express time and location. Danger, danger warnings of far in time and or space are usually rather ineffective. In contrast, communications which indicate immediate and close threat of impact will usually evoke a reaction. Last, the level of fear or arousal. Any message which communicates there may be an extreme danger to oneself and or and or to loved ones is usually effective in making people aware of the threat. However, overdoing it in the level of fear arousal can convey a sense of uncertainty either in content or in tone. This means that there is an optimum level of fear arousal that needs to be uh, achieved and research has shown that this optimum level depends on culture and language. The pie chart uh, to the right of the slide shows the percentages of uh, alerts that have been sent for different hazards. You will uh, find out, you, you, one can easily uh, find out that COVID-19 and wildland fires put together uh, amount for the vast majority of GRI pause alerts. That being said, we have sent alerts for earthquakes, tsunamis, urban and industrial fires, and surprisingly enough, Medicaid's. GRI pause alerts have been used to prompt evacuation or shelter in place. They have been used to advise uh, of stay at home orders and provide protective action guidance. And they have been used to warn people of high or extreme wildfire danger, but also of wildfire approaching residential areas. Let me show you a few examples. This one is from August 15 uh, this year and involves a fire at a plastics factory in an urban area around Athens. August 15 is a national holiday and marks the absolute peak of the holiday season in Greece. The smoke, the smoke plume from the fire was extending well over Athens and was visible uh, a few kilometers away. Uh, we sent a shelter in place alert to areas around the factory. You will see that we added a URL leading to the protective action guidelines section of Civil Protection Greece's website. The, this was a, uh, probably a best practice in that it provided more information that can fit in a 600 character message. The added benefit is that the protective action guidance section of Civil Protection Greece is in multiple languages, which provided 
more information that to those who could not read Greek or English. Another example was the Southern Attica fire less than a month uh, after the previous incident. This was a wildland fire which ignited in a, uh, a wildland urban interface area. It was driven by strong winds and fine herbaceous fuels. We sent four alerts to residential areas in the, in the, in the fire's path. And this was the first time that GRI pause was used to issue an evacuation order in the country. Less than a week or about a week uh, after that, uh, the country faced a Medicaid. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the with the term, Medicaid's are short for Mediterranean hurricanes, and they are pretty much what the term implies. They are non-frontal storms having a closed surface wind circulation around a well-defined low pressure center, which is usually warmer than the surrounding area. They come with intense shower and thunderstorm activity. They are generally smaller in dimensions and less intense than uh, uh, tropical or extratropical cyclones, and they used to be a rarity in the Mediterranean. However, frequency, their frequency and intensity is on the rise, not least because of climate change. In this situation, uh, this situation was the first case where we issued a pre-disaster emergency declaration. Among others, we sent five areas to uh, five alerts to areas in the Mediterranean's projected path, which included the southern Ionian islands, Peloponnese, and parts of Crete. Last but not least, uh, GRI pause has been used on several occasions uh, in the uh, response to COVID-19. Uh, alerts has be, have been used to inform people of stay-at-home orders and provide protective, protective action guidance. This slide outlines the lessons learned from uh, this run of, uh, uh, of, of GRI pause. Having a public alert and warning plan has paid off and uh, I, would strongly, uh, I would strongly recommend it. However, uh, any plan is useless unless you train with it, you practice with it, and you test with it, and you test it using your own alert or warning tool. In addition, building and sustaining such a system, an integrated public alert and, uh, and warning system, will invariably involve your telecommunications sector. And this system cannot uh, survive unless it's based on a sustainable partnership with your telecommunications sector. Using multiple technologies to maximize reach is a definite, definite recommendation, especially because um, a lot of people do not uh, own smartphones or do not may, or may not own smartphones which are capable of, of receiving cell broadcast. Bear in mind that iPause alerts will generate public inter interest. You will get inquiries from the public. You will get media coverage. Uh, if you're using uh, uh, URLs, if you are include URLs in your message, expect an internet traffic spike on your website when you send an alert. Last, educate and inform your public, especially with regard to capabilities. We had a lot of inquiries at the beginning of the system, when the system was brought online. And with every, and with every alert in the, first, in the first few months, uh, we had uh, an impressive amount of inquiries from citizens. However, as the system was used more and more, uh, there, was, there was a learning curve uh, amongst the public. And nowadays, it's part of everyday response. I would dare go as far as saying that it is expected that the system will be used in some, on some emergencies. Last, I would like to emphasize that this has been a team effort. I'm the one doing the presentation, but there, there are probably a couple of hundred people who have worked to build this system. Uh, that obviously includes the Ministry for Digital Governance, which has been a tremendous ally and a tremendous help in, in this situation. Emergency response organizations who do not only provide information, but they actually staff the service. Cell phone and landline service providers uh, in Greece who uh, have established the infrastructure uh, in their networks to be able to transmit messages. And last but not least, cell phone manufacturers who have developed 
software uh, so that their operating systems can support cell broadcast in Greece. I would like to take this opportunity to thank them all for working with us to make Greece a safer place. And with that, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. My, uh, my email is, um, is on this slide. I will stick around for questions. And uh, over to you, Benoit. Thank you, George. Thanks a lot for your presentation. I think it was extremely interesting. And uh, it's always interesting to look at, uh, at Greece because uh, it's one of the countries in Europe that is the most exposed to uh, actually a wide diversity of risks. So, um, it's always interesting to look at um, what you are doing, and especially that you also have to work with um, with a lot of tourists, especially in the summer. So um, that your presentation was very interesting because it showed very well how you try to address uh, all those risks to, to the population. And as you say, the population is also very um, diverse. And the fact that Greece is so touristic also makes um, uh, a lot of other parameters to, to take into account. And uh, and uh, and thanks a lot for sharing also the, the lessons um, learned with us. Uh, I, I remembered uh, so what you said um, in the lessons learned: having a plan has paid off. So to all the other public authorities uh, being here with us today, I think it's important to to keep that in mind. And uh, and with this plan, with this plan, you need to train, practice, and uh, and train, uh, of course. So uh, th that is quite important. And thanks um, thanks for sharing that. Before we move to the next presentation, there's uh, uh, many questions actually that have been uh, have been sent. I'm afraid we won't have time to uh, to read them all. Uh, but th there are many questions actually about um, the the population actually and, and your interaction with the population. So uh, I'll read a few questions maybe together. Maybe you can uh, address them uh, together. So uh, Laure Fallou, for instance, asked. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much for this very interesting presentation and. Uh, question is there a limit of warning you plan to send in order not to create warning fatigue that may reduce the attention paid to each message do you have an idea of how many warnings on average have the re citizens received um then the, there was uh Laure was asking uh, Laure Fallou was asking another question it was uh, have you surveyed the perception and satisfaction level of this warning system by the population and if i can also relate um uh, those questions to another one sent from uh, Kirsty Grant. Uh, so first of all, great presentation. Thank you. Can I ask what was done in Greece to prepare the public for integrating uh, public alerting and warning systems? Okay, uh, so warning fatigue uh, and how do we and how do we integrate the population? Uh, they, the, the cry wolf syndrome is a is def definitely a risk in the sense that if you send too many messages uh people will eventually start uh, thinking of them as uh, part of normal life that being said greece is among the countries that uses uh, this capability sparingly so uh from Judging from, from what I have seen in other countries, uh, we are among the countries that uh, uses this system uh, only for, for grave risks and when all other uh, means have been exhausted. Okay. Uh, this also required some educating of the population. And uh, this came through multiple channels. Uh, we are, um, we, we, there were several um, uh, updates on our website and on our social media pages. Uh, there were interviews that, uh, that were given. Uh, our deputy minister, Mr. Hardalas, gave uh, several uh, interviews uh, about this, which uh, helped to inform the public of the capabilities and of the existence of the system. Uh, however, I think that the single most uh, important determinant of uh, public education in this case, and I mean public education about the system, was the system itself. So we got a lot of inquiries, and I mean a lot of inquiries, after the system was used the first time. A little less, inquiries uh, in the second time, a little less the third one, and so on and so on. Okay, so 
the my, my message is have built or build a a public outreach campaign do this before you launch the system and maintain it while you are using the system Benoit, did that answer the question yeah thank you okay. thank you george for that um i see that we're still receiving many questions and uh, i'm quite cautious with the time as well so uh, i'm just gonna go through one other question and hopefully maybe at the end of this webinar we can take the rest of the questions uh, but there were basically actually several questions about the, um, the costs and the, the financing of this uh, this system. Uh, so mm -hmm. Paolo Pereira was asking who paid cell broadcast in, uh, in Greece. And there was another question from Urban Kunz. Uh, how did you share the cost for the system between the operators and the governments? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the technological infrastructure uh, was built uh was co-funded was co-funded uh by a european union grant uh the operating costs are part of the of the, of the national budget uh and uh carriers and so cell phone carriers they they handled the their part of the infrastructure only so they, they 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 graciously accepted to handle to to develop their internal network infrastructure that allows us to send cell broadcast messages. Okay, thank you, George. Uh, I hope that uh, responds to uh, to the questions that were asked. I see that there's many many questions that have been sent. So what I suggest now is uh, we go through the next presentation uh, for for time reasons. And then if we have more time at the end of the webinar, we can get back to um, to the, the discussion. So I stole the questions that you have uh, asked yeah, already. I'll stick, around, I'll stick around. And if uh, if we don't have uh, time to, to answer further questions, uh, uh, anyone, uh, you may please uh, uh, connect with me via email, shoot me an email, and I'll answer it to the best of my abilities. OK, so excellent. Much. Thank you, George Efraristopoli, and I will now give the floor to um, Johnny Duvines, so professor in geography at the University of Avignon. And Johnny, you're going to uh, present to us, um, so I'll read the title of your presentation, Way to Go, Combining Technical, Human, Contextual and Structural Aspects for Effective National Integrated Public Alerting, alerting and Warning Systems. Uh, Thanks, Benoit. Uh, so nice to meet you. Uh, I'm a professor in geography at the University of Avignon in South of France. And thanks, Benoit, for this uh, invitation to INA conference. So during this talk, I, I'd like to discuss the, the way to go to make sure that the national integrated public warning and alert system will be effective. And for us to achieve, to achieve such aim, we have to combine technical, human, contextual, and structural aspects. And to prove such ID, uh, I will take or I will show local feedbacks and results obtained uh, by comparing the system existing in different countries. So you can go to the next slide, please, Benoit. So let's start with a common definition. We all agree with, with the purpose of alerts. The alert uh, aims at delivering messages to one population at risk of imminent threats or dangers with the goal of maximizing the probability that people take protective actions and minimizing their delay in taking those actions. So, so this, defi this definition is clear for us. The next slide, Benoit, please. Uh, however, the alerting process is more complex in reality. Reducing with this complexity requires answering simple questions such as such as uh, George's uh, recorded. What, who, when, where, why, how? Who alert? What are the objectives and the expected results, especially for the population? Which organizations and managers are involved? Which tools are usually used and for which hazard are they most relevant, for example? And we know that CBC is not useful in case of a terrorism attack, while a location based SMS suffer from. Uh, network congestion. But reducing this complexity also requires answering other questions and more complex questions, 
such as what is the historical procedures in the studied, studied country? What's, what is the sense of communication between authorities and populations? What are the needs of populations, the public perceptions of hazards, the public reactions to messages that psychological, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral responses to stimuli, or what are the cultural prospects? So we must therefore understand that EPOs must be adapted to each country's situation with no pre-established solution, while at the same time having systems that are scalable and adaptive to current and future challenges. Or whether common aspects must be taken into account, and I will recall them in the following slides. Thanks, Benoit. Can you go to the next slide, please? First, let's deal with the technological aspects. Many solutions exist since more than 30 years, such as mails, web, smartphone applications like Cat1 in uh, Germany, for numbers like uh, 112, social medias, radios, televisions. A few sirens exist and still exist in several countries, phone calling number, door-to-door -door in case of flooding, for example, megaphones, location-based SMS and cell broadcast. But you can also observe uh, or um, study peer-to-peer -peer solutions, so smartphones can communicate between us and they can send an alert, uh, or e-call in cars, citizen networks, uh, geotargeted solutions, and more and more technological. So some of them some of technologies exist in some countries. Um, many, many countries try to create a different technologies. And the next slide, please. And we know that uh, the multiplication of alert tools allows us to, to overcome the limits, the limits of each tool in order to maximize the probability that people receive alerts in sufficient time. In this example, I show you the spatial distribution of sirens in the south of France and the recent evolution. The dark points uh, indicate new sirens in the future uh, SIP system, uh, system d'alerte d'information à la population in French, and uh, these new sirens mainly cover the urban areas, while small areas and poorly densely areas are not equipped by sirens. And the gray, the gray points, sorry, also indicate that old sirens will be dismantled or supported by local authorities. Then sirens do not cover all areas in France, and these solutions will be fortunately coupled with CBC and LBSMS in 2022 to respect the European decree approved in 2018. Sorry. So in the next slide, the first challenge. Is, can be summarized as follow. Even though technological solutions are becoming more and more efficient and fast, it is necessary to coordinate the technological solutions in a multi-channel and in a single platform, like GR Alert, uh, as George has presented a, a few minutes ago, uh, while being aware that the alert will not affect part of the population. So, some people cannot receive the alert and it could be a problem or not. So in the next slide, I just want to discuss several human aspects. The population is the targeted uh, uh, public um, um, and many examples show that dangerous situations are not perceived as such by individuals. Like in this photo, a person who finds himself trapped by waters after having forced a, rail, a road block. Given uncertainties that are unavoidable during danger and thus others, people struggle to make a decision. They therefore tend to continue their activities even they receive a message or an alert message. And they can carry on with what they were doing instead of gating to safety, as they consider that the consequences of the event would be more serious than the hazard itself. Some people can also give priority to what they feel attached to, 
like the living environment or place of a family. So in the next slide, we can also observe and uh, take different examples uh, when we also regard other hazards. In 1999, in the photo top of the left, individuals remain impassive while a fire, a fire is in progress in the tunnel of Mont Blanc in south of France. And even as repeated, repeated messages are transmitted by low speakers to reach the evacuation tunnel. So they remain impassive. On the right, in 2018, at the arrival of a tsunami in Dan Langpun, people run to flee the event, most of them. But in this video, we can observe one person goes, goes against the event to understand and know what is going on. Another dramatic example in Mati, Greece, faced with the respect and um, faced with the spread of the fire, the authorities sent messages to evacuate the urbanized area, but they contributed to causing traffic jams on the road, road networks, which were few in number in the area. And unfortunately, more than 30 people died burned in the cross. So on the next slide, one of the challenges is important. We, had, we have sorry, to adapt safety instructions to the needs of populations in real time and to their understanding of the situation. But we need also to stop blaming them for, for their, their bad behaviors, sorry. Some other aspects also of paramount importance is the impact of context on alert. It's the next slide, please, Benoit. As a study published every, every year by the French Radio Nuclear Institute shows, the perception of risk changes over the years. And these elements play on the stress and fear generated by the unknown. On this graph, we can see that in 2001, following the attacks on the World Trade Center, insecurity in France was the first risk felt by population, whereas in 2005, it was fear of unemployment due to a financial crisis. And in 2015, the risk of a terrorist attack came back to the forefront due to several events in France. And with the COVID health crisis and uncertainties about future social change, individuals will surely fear almost all risk in 2021. In the next slide, in a recent study, we want to organize training exercise at the University of Avignon, and we want to test tools and to observe reactions of students and staff. We distributed in before the event, a questionnaire to a students and staff to know their, their perception of values. Among the interesting results, I do, not have to, I do not have time to present all the results, we can notice that the issuer of the alert is not the one we could expect. In case of fire, the 765 respondents indicate that the fire department will be the most legitimate to issue the alert. In the event of an intrusion here, it will be the university and the presidential services who could be the most um, interesting services to send the alert and not mayors or prefects, while these actors are the representative and the crisis manager of the alert authorities who have the capability to send a message. So we can observe a gap between the needs of students and staff at the university and the real context in France. So Benoit, in, in the next slide, please. Uh, so for these contextual aspects, we need to adapt technologies to each event, to each public, and to further explain the uncertainties and the unpredictability of hazard and threats. So in the next slide, please, Benoit, in the um, to close this presentation, sorry, I also want to highlight the organizational and structural aspects and the impacts on alert. 
by comparing the alerting process between countries, like for example here between Australia on the left and Belgium on the right, we can observe differences between the sense of communication, the place of competent authorities. authorities. Australia has been using LBSMS since 2013 and has an alerting federal structuration, which makes it possible to adapt the alert to the characteristics of each state. On the other example, on the right, Belgium abandoned its siren network in 2016 to replace it with LBSMS, while centralizing several digital alert tools within a single platform, be alert. Both systems are related to existing political and state structures and were put in place in consultation or in coordination with many stakeholders after several years. On the next slide, if we extend if we extend, sorry, the analysis of uh, to, to tools implemented elsewhere, we notice a clear link with major disasters that have occurred in the next, in the near past or in the in, in the previous years. For example, with the first epos in United States in 2006, just one year after the uh, Katrina hurricane or be alert in uh, 2017 following the attacks to Bruxelles, to Brussels in, uh, in 2016. However, such an analysis obscures the weight of political decision making and the administrative structures in place, as well as the organizational and operational legacies. Consequently, even if the European decree imposes a SMS alert in 2022, we must be careful not to make technological determinism. So on the first, uh, on the next slide, sorry, Benoit. So on this point, it is clear that we need to adapt technologies to each organizations in terms of rules, law, managers to take into account the history in each country and to take time to create an efficient system. And in the next slide, Benoit, so after the presentation, so what? How do I conclude my intervention and how can we hope to uh, observe efficient national epos? For me, more than technological aspects, the tools used must be adapted to the needs of population of targeted communities, to the local specificities, the cinetics of hazards, the risk levels, the risk culture, and it is mainly the approach to alert that must change. Instead of asking people to adapt to one single systems, system, we must develop shape-shifting systems that can adapt to the needs of local uh, specificities. And in addition, alerts should be an opportunity to practice safety procedures as a way to support the community, but we need also to disrupt people's daily lives. So we need to explain before you use a system. We must allow ourselves to make mistakes and the untimely triggering of an alert must be decriminalized. So it's not because we create new technological systems that we can hope an efficient system. In this photo, I it's important, the emergency alert and warning systems are really important and interesting, but on this photo, where the people, the structure, the contexts are, it's a question. So thanks for your attention. Benoit, the next slide, I, I just indicate a, a few referee on a recent publication, uh, which type of public warning systems should friends should friend adopt, adopt by uh, 2021, it's in English. We also published a recent um, scientific uh, review on sirens in France, and we also uh, uh, produced a video explaining the relation between crowd movement and panic, but for this, it's in French. Thanks for your attention, and I can answer to a few questions if you want. Thank you very much, uh, Johnny. Thanks a lot for your presentation. I see it's uh, it's almost four, but I guess um, we can extend a bit uh, of a few minutes this uh, this webinar. 
uh, I hope uh, you and, and, and George can still be here a few minutes. And for the participants who have to leave, you can still listen to the, the recording afterwards to go through um, the question. So there is the, the possibility to ask question. It's on the um, on the tool uh, that we use for for this webinar. Um, so first of all, thank you, Johnny, for for your presentation. It was very clear and, uh, and informative. And if I try to uh, to recall uh, basically the, the the necessities that you have presented, um, they were first to take into account the technological aspects, which is necessary to coordinate the technological solutions in a multi-channel platform. There were some human aspects, and as you rightly said, people sometimes, especially in in, in times of crisis, people struggle to uh, make decisions so it's important to adapt uh, the safety instructions to the people and understand they, their needs and as you said don't blame them for their behavior uh, you presented some contextual aspects um, where it's important to adapt the technology to each event and each public and some structural aspects where technologies need to be adapted to each organization each country uh, and of course take time to really implement a, a good system mm -hmm um so thanks a lot for for, for that uh, a question was sent by uh, mr victor manuel salgado gonzalez uh, so first of all a uh, great event and great speakers so i'm glad to see that um, this has been beneficial to uh, to the audience so a question for for you johnny uh, do you think that sharing emergency alerts with escaping routes or reunion points in web maps could be handy to minimize citizens deaths uh, sorry, I don't hear the, 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 the beginning of the question. So if you think that sharing the emergency alerts with, expect, with escaping routes, so basically to include those routes in the, in the alerts, do, do you think that could be uh, helpful to minimize the people's death? Yeah, I think it, it could be useful, yeah, surely. So we, we need to minimize the delay to alert people and to, to define the escaping um, uh, routes or, or roads in, in, in a few in a few delays. So we need to um, to send clear messages that many people uh, understand that it, it's a clear difficulty because when when we send a message using CBC or, or LBSMS, we send a single message to many different people and they want to have different information in real time. So. Um, when we use different uh, information tools or, or disseminators, we can hope that we can send different messages and we can adapt the message to the receiver. So yeah. For me, yeah, it's a clear uh, option. Yeah, okay. Um, I had an, uh, another question is, um, so I'm not sure you can, uh, you can, uh, you really had time to like step, step back and look into, into it, but uh, I know you've been looking at the, the practice of, uh, of public alerts for, for now several, uh, several years. Um, so like, did, did you notice some kind of change of, uh, of pattern or change of, uh, of usage uh, during the, the recent COVID crisis? Did you um, notice something interesting about the way governments uh, communicate with the population? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in France, we, we observed a, a change in, in the use of uh, uh, SMS, for example, to inform, to inform people on uh, safety instructions. But for me, it's, it's not good because we, we send messages to inform people and we do not explain uh, why or you, we use the, the, the system and the technology. Uh, for example, we, we, we received in France a, a recent message indicating that we need to, to download the application to uh, uh, to Santi Covid in French to to to, uh, uh, to reduce the, the, the danger. But many people do not know how the system um, works and why this uh, the, the government send a message. So uh, the problem is that. We use the technology, but we do not take time to explain to the people why we use it. And yeah. for me, it's, it's information, in, information, information messages, and, and not alert messages. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, that's interesting. And actually, if I can uh, link it to one of one question that was asked to the, the previous presentation, and uh, I didn't go through yet, but m maybe you can uh, already provide an answer to it. And, and George, hopefully, you can also complete. Uh, the answer but uh, so there was in maybe next week uh, last week sorry a, a malicious sms that was sent to many people in france um where it was supposed to be so somebody 
well took the identity of the French government to send SMS um, to many Android phones, apparently, uh, about COVID, and they were asking to click on a link and some information, and that link was obviously uh, malicious. So, um, do you have some clues on how this usurpation can of of public identity can be pre prevented? It's one of the problem you know, using such technology. So I don't know how we can prevent such uh, drawbacks, but it is clear that that mainly people do not clearly understand why the government sends such a message. And the problem is that the technology exists, but we do not take time to explain why and, and how we can use it. I don't know if in Greece or in other country uh, they send also messages uh, during the COVID. Uh, crisis. I, I hope, but I, I, I hope also that um, government or authorities take time to explain why they use it. Uh, George, if you want to the, answer to it. Please. Yeah, there, there are two things. Uh, the first has to do with cybersecurity, so you need to keep your system secure. Uh, the second thing has to do with monitoring. So when when you're operating a uh, an operation center, when you're you have activated an operation center, part of the job of this operation center is to do media monitoring, and uh, part of your part of your job should be uh, looking into what kind of uh, false information uh, may be uh, circulating out there, either. Uh, uh, intentionally or unintentionally and uh you need you need to decide very quickly on uh, how and when and whether you will uh jump in to 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 set the record straight so i, I would i would uh, would summarize by two things one it would be cybersecurity, and the second would be media monitoring and uh and response to uh uh to fake news or rumors yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, George. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, I had a few more questions. Uh, I had a question to you, George, from Amélie Granja, but Johnny, feel free to jump in the, the debate uh, as well. Um, so first of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, can, uh, in Greece, can mayors send alerts to, or is it only for uh, national um, authorities? Uh, there, there are two things. Uh, one is who physically sends the alert, and second is how the decision is being made. Uh, the the system is operated by the uh, uh, by the General Secretariat for Civil Protection. Uh, however, the decision to issue an alert is taken obviously in consultation with uh, the local authorities of the affected areas, and they are they are a mm -hmm. very useful uh, source of information. Uh, especially when it comes to the impact or to the vulnerabilities of uh, an area that is or could be affected by disaster. Yeah, and uh, I guess we can uh, relate that also to what uh, what you presented, uh, John, in your presentation, showing that the different practices um, of public warning depending on um, on the countries, and obviously each country is uh, is different and has different cultures, I guess. Yeah, yeah. In addition, uh, uh, yeah, mayors. Ah, sorry, Bruno. No, no. Go ahead. Um, mayors in France can send uh, an alert uh, nowadays, but I, I'm not sure with the new and the future system they can. So it, it, we observe comparing by comparing different uh, systems in in different countries that the mayors are not always included in the na national alert system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I'm just trying to uh, to go through all the questions. I see the time is passing. I'll just take one last question. Uh, more more for you, actually, George. Um, which is whether you have considered using um, the Galileo-based uh, public warning systems. I don't know if you're aware of it, but there's apparently a possibility to use satellite systems to also send alerts to the population which is out of the scope of the legislation but can still be another technology that can be looked at uh we we're certainly looking into it uh 
uh, a member of my staff is uh, is part of the is is participating in the working group and is following is following the work. Uh, the it's it's certainly a consideration. Uh, whether it would materialize or not uh, will essentially depend on the added value uh, with regard to our current system. But I think it's probably a little too soon to answer to, for me to be able to answer that question. Uh, that being yeah. said, it is okay. a, it okay. is a consideration. It is a consideration. Okay, thank you. And uh, finally, there was one last question also from from uh, Fiona Lee. Um, which is about uh, so whether these um, these early warning also work after an earthquake and if there's a, spe um, a specific uh, procedure when there's an earthquake. Uh, okay, uh, the uh, the warning would work. Uh, however, it obviously would not be able to warn people before the earthquake occurs. Uh, it would. Mm -hmm. Would, however, and it has actually been used after an earthquake, immediately after an earthquake, to provide people with basic uh, guidance uh, of of what to do and not to do uh, after after an earthquake. For example, stay away from damaged buildings. Right. Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Uh, I'm sorry we had time to to respond to respond to most of the questions maybe not all of them but uh, um, if uh, you still have questions to so i'm speaking here to the audience feel free to uh, to write to to either to to us or, or directly to uh, to the speakers uh, and i'm sure they'll be happy to uh, to assist you uh, before i wrap up uh, johnny george is there something you would like to uh, to add to what we've uh, we've discussed today you don't have to so. <laughs> No, it's interesting. We we work on alert, so it 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 could be interesting, and I hope people uh, learn something. Uh, I'm sure. Yeah, we we received uh, we received many uh, many great comments, and and people are still commenting now on uh, to thank you for for the presentation and the the information provided. And um, actually, these these two presentations are example that it's always good to first to look at what is being done abroad in in other countries because uh, obviously. Countries have different uh, levels of, of advancement, so it's good to to look at what challenges have been faced abroad and what the the lessons learned were. Uh, and also, we saw with your presentation, Johnny, that I think it's it's always good to 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 include in the process the academicians and professors because they also have um, a lot of information and and have like an, a good overlook, both like time-wise and geographic geography was at, at what is being done uh, in other countries it has been done in, in other places and also um, to have also more like a cross sector um, view like uh, i know johnny you have a, a geography background so it's also interesting to look at the many different disciplines that are linked in the in the alert so it's good also to to include the uh, academy um, academy world so yeah, I'll just give a few uh, notes to conclude. And yeah, so um, yeah, some uh, these are some useful links. You will see these slides. Uh, you will receive it in your mailbox. Uh, a few useful links if you want to uh, to dig more the, the subject. Um, Johnny, you provided also some links in your presentation. So thank you so much for that. Uh, you can also have a look at. Uh, our webpage on public warning where you find many different information and we have a specific document also about public warning systems that uh, explains a bit uh, deeper the different technologies and uh, and how they work so i think it's interesting to to have a look at that and of course the the recording of this webinar will be shared on our website so you can always uh, um, listen to it uh, again and, and find all the information there it will be shared on our webpage on, on webinars uh, Ina can also assist you with uh, with any question that you have regarding the EU legislation specifically, but also the, the best practices in implementing public warning systems. We can also put you in contact with solution providers um, that do provide solutions on, on, on public warning systems and also with authorities in other countries. We can also organize some national events to, uh, to discuss about that. Um, 
and uh, we will have also a dedicated session uh, at the next SINA conference, which will happen uh, in October 2021. Unfortunately, it's uh, it's still in uh, about one year. Uh, but well, until then, we, we still aim at providing all the information we can on public warning systems. So uh, the presentations and the recording will be available um, tomorrow afternoon on our website and will be um, sent by uh, by email. And you can always have a look at our webpage actually for um, for the upcoming webinars, also the past ones, and, and listen to, uh, to 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 previous webinars. And so this was the last webinar of the year. We've had many in the past weeks. All of them were uh, very interesting. And uh, we'll resume our webinar sessions in January, on the 19th of January. You can already save the date, where we will have. Uh, a webinar about uh, drones for public safety and present to you a, a global perspective so you'll receive all the information in due time. Until then, uh, thanks a lot for attending this, uh, this webinar. Stay safe and uh, have a happy holiday season. Merry Christmas. And thank you very much for to our two speakers, Johnny Duvinet and uh, George Karayanis. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Thanks for hosting, for hosting us.